The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant, O God, that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move every human heart, and especially the hearts of the people of this land, the United States of America, in our community here and in the state of Michigan, that the barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatred cease, and that as our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, it gives me pleasure to introduce this, um, our speaker who will appear to you in video this morning, the Reverend Dr. Gail Fisher Stewart. I met Gail um, actually as we sometimes do these days via social media about five years ago, around the time that she was ordained a priest as um, um, you know, someone that came with a lifetime already of experience. Um, Gail is currently, she has really three streams that come together for us today. She currently as a priest in the church, as I said, she was ordained a priest in 2015. She's the interim rector of St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Washington, DC, which I should just say is a very historic African-American church. It, was the first actually independent African-American Episcopal church, meaning it was not started as a mission, as a segregated mission by a white, uh, either diocese or a wealthier parish, white parish, um, started by um, someone on our feast calendars, Alexander Crummel, of whom my first son is named. Um, Gail is a rare bird in that she is a native born and raised in Washington, DC. And her first career um, was as a police officer with the Washington DC Metropolitan Police Department. As an African-American, she rose to the rank of captain, quite an accomplishment right there. And she also earned several degrees, bachelor's, master's, and a PhD. And um, upon her retirement, taught at the university level. Um, she's a graduate of the University of Maryland, an American university, um, which is where she received her doctorate and other degrees. And also Wesley Theological Seminary where she got a theological degree before ordination. She's won a few already, some prizes. I met Gail um, when she came, started writing. And in fact, I read one of the articles that she had published in the Anglican Theological Review. I was her peer reviewer, um, anonymous peer reviewer of an article that she wrote in 2017 called To Serve and Protect the Race, Race, the Police and the Episcopal, Pre Episcopal Church in Black Lives Matter era. And um, shortly after that, she ended up getting an honorary doctorate of divinity from Colgate University. This year, this past summer, she was the editor and the genius behind over 40 people um, compiling uh, essays called Preaching Black Lives Matter, which is a collection of both sermons and essays around this issue. Church Publishing has put it out. Um, there are a few copies at actually Father, in Father Drew's office if you're interested, and it's also available as an ebook. Um, shameless plug, somebody that you might know at Christ Church has contributed one of those um, to that book, Preaching Black Lives Matter. Um, she's right now also working on a full length book of her own, um, which is of course following up on her other articles. And it's really about called to serve and protect bridging the gap between the police and the black community, which is a curriculum she's developed. And this book will then be a theological reflection on this. So um, with that to be said, um, the video is um, Gail and myself and Father Drew um, in, I think, a great conversation, and I'll turn it back to Father Drew to play that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Walter. Uh, this is the 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 full the full interview and conversation that we had will also be posted. This has been edited down for um, our conversation today, but you'll be able to see the whole conversation uh, online as well. Um, well, so with that said, I'm gonna share a screen and uh, let us dive in.
So Gail, my question to you, having edited and, and really shepherded um, this book and working on another, why do you write what you write? Most people, you know, it, it is number one, so good to be with, with all of you today. And that is, as they say, that's a heavy question because most people write for themselves. Mm. Right, you write for yourselves. You have a question, so you decide you're going to write on it, so you can answer your own question. And if, and if anybody else picks up the book, that's that's a plus. But primarily, uh, it's it's to really struggle with questions that you have of yourself. That being a part of a white society, a white culture, a white church, you have to leave part of yourself at the door in order to fit in. And just as, as being Black in society, you try to assimilate, you try to go along, to get along, in a way you have to kill a part of yourself, kill a part that God has created you to be, to be something that you're really not. And so this book really answers those questions. You know, it, it starts off with preaching Black Lives Matter. And so you have actual sermons. And this came about as, as a result of talking to blacks and whites, non-whites, who said they've never heard a sermon on race in their church, be they black or white. Never have heard a, church, uh, a sermon on, on race. And also speaking to, to clergy who said, I can't preach on race. I can't, I can't do that. If I, if I want my job, if I want my congregation, if I don't want them to say, you know, we won't, we won't uh, honor our tithes, I can't preach on race. And so to have folks, black and non-black, white and non-white, saying the very same thing when we see what's going on around us in, in society, um, I, I was talking to my brother and I, I think he attends a non-denominational church. And I said, with all this going on, have you heard a sermon? Now the pastor, the founder of his church is white, but the flock is 99.9999% black. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, have you heard? He said, no. I said, with all this going on, you've never heard. He said, yeah. And a few of us went to him, uh, went to the pastor and said, you know, with, with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, when are you going to preach? And he says, that's not my job. I'm trying to get you to heaven. Mm. And I said, and you're still with that church, <laughs> right? Mm. But, you know, for the context, the social activities and all those things, they, they, they stay. And so to have a way of beginning a discussion on, on preaching about race, preaching about difficult topics, race being only one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. Even to have a Black Lives Matter sign in front of your church, right? I figure mm -hmm. a Black church should be the first church mm -hmm. to have a Black Lives Matter sign in front of the church. But I've had people come up to me, Black folks, and say, I'm uncomfortable with that sign. And I said, why? Well, you know, uh, we're trying to evangelize to white people, and it might make them uncomfortable. Mm. And I said, so you will deny a sign that lifts up your value, your worth, to make white people feel comfortable. And they're going, like, yeah, yeah. And I go, like, something's wrong with that picture. We, we need to be able to have brave space, not safe space, but brave space where we can actually have these conversations. And so the book has actual sermons that were preached or people wanted, would like to be able to preach. And then the, the second section uh, deals with advocating for Black lives. How much are you willing to risk as a pastor, as a lay person, to say Black lives matter? And the, the reality of it is, if, if you are a white pastor in a white church, a predominantly white church, in all probability, you would never, ever have to speak a word of Black Lives Matter, and it would be fine. And so I wanted to ask those who, um, who, are re who really risk their livelihood, because they don't have to say anything. They don't have to advocate. They don't have to protest. But they are deep in all of that because they said, if I'm going to follow Jesus, I need to be where Jesus is. And Jesus is in the margins. And that's where 
Black lives have always been placed in, in this country. And then the third one, it deals with education, education. Um, what is formation? Okay, so we form Christians. We form Episcopal Christians. But what exactly is that? And what are the materials used? And so if, if I come into the Episcopal Church and I'm learning about the church and, and I'm, I am African-American, do we really talk about the history, the role of the church in, in, in lifting up slavery, keeping slavery going, segregation, discrimination? Or do we just kind of start with, you know, the Jesus is good and Jesus loves you. Are we willing to actually put forth the effort to have people understand how people like me have been treated by the Episcopal Church, by the Church of England. The, the Episcopal Church is the eldest daughter of the Church of England. And so that I can make a, a valid decision, you know, is this a church I really want to be a part of? And then the second part has to do with, with seminaries. What's being taught? Who's being taught? You know, if you want to get James Cone, Kelly Brown Douglas, if you want to get uh, Geneva Cannon, if you, if you want to get these folks, do you have to take the black track? Mm -hmm. Right? Do you have to take the black track? Or are they electives? Why can't they be in the mainstream of the theologians we are required to study as opposed to having this black track this Latino track, this LGBT track, why can't this all be merged into, we're going to study theologians. And then the other part that's not in this book that kind of propelled me, is how is it to be a member of black clergy and have a congregation that doesn't look like you? Can you be your authentic self? And in some instances, uh, you may find yourself, not only are you the only person of color in the congregation, you might be the only person of color in the town. And whether or not the Episcopal Church recognizes that, what are the resources, and, and, and what is the, the spiritual, psychological, and physical trauma that these clergy are experiencing? Um, if you're going to be a black bishop, you're going to be a bishop of a white diocese. Mm -hmm. What's that like? <laughs> and so we could, you know, we, we could do that with, you know, Asians and indigenous folks and how we, how we, how we worship. Do I have to leave parts of a worship experience at the door so I can be Anglican? And do I only see myself in the liturgy during Black History Month? We have the Book of Common Prayer and how I enflesh it, I ought to be able to enflesh it multiculturally as long as I follow the framework. So anybody who walks into an Episcopal church, can they see themselves somehow in the music, the prayer, the preaching, something? Or do you have to leave yourself at the door and become Anglican, which equals white? And so do we really want to have those types of conversations where people say, well, if you're going to be Episcopal, then you have to do da 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 No, I'm Episcopal because I believe in certain doctrines. But what I bring to the Episcopal Church, it, can I bring myself? When we commemorated uh, 1619, I have a piece of cloth that from a distance looks like they're petals of, of flowers. But I use that as the frontal on the, on the table, on the altar. But when you got close to it, you saw that they were the insides of slave ships with the bodies in them. I said, mm. we're gonna do 1619, we're gonna do 1619. And so for Black History Month, I had Kente all through the church. I said, we're, we're gonna be black. If this is the only month we can, we can be black, we're gonna be black. And, and I serve a historically black church, um, but even historically black churches, uh, as I said in the book, they're really um, black churches in white face. They're really white churches with black people sitting in the pews. 
because they have left behind who they are. And when we use that term, multicultural, we have multicultural churches. I said, no, you don't. You have multiracial churches. But there's only one culture, and that's the Anglican culture. People are going to be uncomfortable because you're, they will see it as attacking something that is dear to them. You're, you're attacking my church. You're attacking my, my faith. No, we're just trying to see, can we actually broaden this thing called church to be truly, truly inclusive. So these are, these are some of the things that if we are really going to talk about race, and we hear it all the time in the Episcopal Church, racial reconciliation. Um, number one, it, you cannot reconcile something that was never together. So if we're trying to achieve something that never was, we set ourselves up for failure. Why do we have all black churches? And we don't want to ask that question. Like, why do we still, we know why we have all black churches, but why are a lot of them still all black? Especially when you find yourselves like my church, uh, we're in exile in our own community because our entire community has changed. It's been gentrified. But there's a fear in evangelizing to whites that when the whites come in, the whites will take over and the little bit of blackness that we have will disappear. We won't be a black church anymore. When whites come in, people who have lived there their entire lives are, are pushed out. And so when you talk about evangelizing and bringing whites into black churches, although there are a few historically black churches in the, diet, in, in, in the denomination, in the Episcopal church that have had success, you have to be able to ask those difficult questions. What are you afraid of? And we know as we look in, as we look in, in with communities that there gets to be a certain tipping point when there are too many people of color, whites will leave. But when their kids get of dating age, then they will also move. Mm. <laughs> and so we have to be comfortable asking those questions and showing the data and asking, why is that? And when our churches call clergy of color or bishops of color, is that a social experiment to prove that we're not racist? So all of this has, has bubbled up since, since uh, putting together this book. And I think we need to be able to an ask and answer those questions um, in brave space, safe space, and because we truly love each other and want to be the church that God is calling us to be. And then we can be an example to the world we, we say we want to fix. But we have to fix us first before we can fix outside. Mm. Thank you, Gail. Yeah. You, Gail, you, 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 that last comment of yours, um, we got to fix us first before we can fix the outside. Um, as a black woman, as a black priest, um, what does that look like uh, to you? Uh, what is the work that we need to be we, we need to be about uh, as as a church, as a congregation, and as individual Christians? Um, what's the fixin' and what's the work um, that we need to be about? It is definitely soul work. It is work that will break your heart. It is long term. But primarily, it, it's it's really looking at, you know, a diocese and asking, why is it like this? You know, let's look at the racial makeup of our parishes and why they are like that. You know, we, we, can, we can begin with um, the, the presiding bishop. Folks think we're post-racial because we have a black presiding bishop. It is all over, but we know what happened with Obama, right? <laughs> There was there's backlash. What so what what does that mean? And again, it goes back to to that social experiment. The church has to make a commitment. Uh, we've been to enough anti-racism trainings and sacred ground and all of these things that we're doing. But is what does it what does making Black Lives Matter a priority in this church look like? I don't have that answer. 
But that's something that we really have to wrestle with to begin this. What does making Asian lives matter a priority? LGBT lives matter a priority? What does that look like? And it, it truly begins for me with, with formation. Um, the, the materials we use in forming Episcopal Christians, we just can't tan up the folks on the cover. What is it about the Episcopal Church that has drawn you? What is it about the Episcopal Church that um, you, you have difficulty with? Let's, let's look at these doctrines. Let's look at these uh, creeds. Uh, in, in seminary, we spent two semesters on the Nicene Creed, two entire semesters studying the Nicene Creed. And at the end, the professor said, now you don't have to believe this at all, but your final paper is why you do or do not believe this. It took me 30 pages to explain mm. <laughs> what I like, didn't like about the Nicene Creed. And so if we have those types of opportunities to uh, kind of dissect what it is about the Episcopal Church. Where will we get a hymnal that is uh, multicultural as opposed to trying to juggle multiple hymnals, right? Mm. This question about making Black lives matter, why should this matter to white people, to white Episcopalians? I thought we followed Jesus. <laughs> And I don't even have to say that he was a brown-skinned Jew, right? I don't, I don't have to say that. But shouldn't we be lifting up each and every person created by and in the image of God? And some of those just happen to be black. Some of those just happen to be indigenous. Some of those just happen to be to be white. You know, if we if we look at Western Christianity. Some folks will tell you that everything they learned about discrimination and racism and prejudice came from the church. Mm. And so mm. why is it that it's fairly easy for the church and also society to teach what is negative, but it's difficult to lift up what is positive? positive. I mean, let, let's look, we have, we have laws on the books that outlaw discrimination and prejudice, but we can't get society to do that. But if we start putting in place laws that discriminate, folks, folks can get on board real quick with that. Mm. So it, it, it's, it's, if, if the church is going to be the church, as opposed to what King says, some social club, then we need to get busy about the business of, of Jesus and lifting up everyone, truly valuing um, every single person and, and dissecting what has been taught by the church about people who are not white, straight, and male. Because again, the only reason we have black churches is not because black people decided they wanted to separate themselves. It was because either we couldn't go into the white churches or we were up in the balcony. Define whiteness. Whiteness is the standard. It is the proximity of whiteness. Okay? How close we can get to being white that all too many of us value. Um, you you mentioned it. it was really strong language that caught me um, even personally, and um, I, I suspect it probably caught some of our, our our audience today. You said that you've got to kill a part of you mm -hmm. to enter into the Episcopal Church, mm -hmm. uh, to enter into um, white society. I think it would be helpful if you're willing to unpack that a little bit so that others can have um, an understanding of what it means um, to, to be a woman, uh, to be a black woman, living, working um, within a predominantly white community. In the book, and I'm going to read just a portion of it. It's called Why I Hate Myself, mm. Internalized Racial Oppression. 
I am an American, a brown-skinned, nappy-haired, infinitive-splitting descendant of sub-Saharan Africans and the British. Yet for all too many years to assimilate, I tried to become white. Because in these United States, to be American, to be seen as fully American is to be white. Not Caucasian, but white. That concocted, fear-derived, non-existent, but real social construct, whiteness held aloft by so-called American values. I've suffered the trauma of being black in America while trying to be white, but I am not the only one. A couple of years ago, at the beginning of school year, my friend's daughter, she's eight, first day of school, she comes home, something's wrong. The kids won't play with me, she says. My friend, her mother, begins to comfort her daughter, probably just the first day of school, who's in, who's out, who's new. Her daughter says, they say I am too dark. Her mother now frowns, careful not to let her daughter see her face, thinking. Before she can say anything, her daughter asks, do you think if I paint myself white, they will play with me? It happened two years ago. Some mothers start perming it at age four. And the, the chemicals used, number one, if you leave them on too long, will give your scalp a second degree burn. Um, bleaching cream is still a multi-billion dollar industry worldwide. And so this whole thing of um, trying to be white, the only way I can have long, long hair is to have a weave. And I made it short enough so I can't get that now. Okay, this is just, you know, I, I, can't, I can't weave it anymore. Right. This whole thing, this whole standard, we know that the standard of beauty was always blonde and blue eyed. I grew up where blondes have more fun, right? Um, when we had the first Miss America, Vanessa Williams, folks said, okay, mm. she's, she's the first, but, you know, Suzette Charles, which, who was the runner up, was really more talented, but Vanessa was closer to white. Like, if we're going to have a black, a first black Miss America, she's gonna be as close to white as we can get her. And so this whole struggle of trying to fit in, and then even in church, I have to forget those things uh, that, that kept our ancestors strong. Yes, the, some were Christian when they came here, you know, Christian did not start, Christianity did not start in this country. Christianity was in Africa. So there were black African Christians, you know, there were Muslims, they, and they brought certain aspects of, of their faith with them and that's what sustained them. But then we have to lose some of that in order to be Episcopal trying to fit in, but then realizing, as, as my niece said, you know, I said, you know, we've been trying to assimilate. She said, but we had to try it to know it doesn't work. She said, it doesn't work. We will never be white. Therefore, we would need to figure out who we are and be who we are. Mm. And if we're going to be multicultural churches, then we need to be multicultural. You need to see the cultures of the folks who are in the community or in the church. You know, we have churches that call themselves multicultural because they have an Anglican, an Anglican and a, a Latino congregation. No, you got two separate churches. When do you come together to be one church? The white church and the Latino church, what would it take to actually come together and meld those services into one? Being black in America is traumatic. Because mm -hmm. you're constantly trying to be something you will never, ever be. And then when you try to be yourself, it's seen as something negative. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. The book Thank Preaching you. Black Lives Matter. Thank you. All right. I actually can't thank you enough for this conversation. Thank wow. you. Thank you for the uh, opportunity. Well, hello again, friends. Um, are we all back together? Excellent. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I hope you um, 
appreciated, um, if not enjoy, even enjoyed, uh, that conversation that Father Walter and I were able to have with, with Gail. Uh, it certainly was a um, meaningful and um, challenging and hopeful conversation uh, for me. Um, Walter, I want to just start our, our part of the conversation with, with a question for you. Uh, what in that conversation, um, what stood out uh, to you? Thank you, Drew. I, you know, when she talked about um, the reality today, which is different than 30, 40, 50 years ago, of um, and, and th that time, if you were a black priest in the Episcopal church, like Michael Curry's father, who was a priest, you would be serving in a predominantly black segregated conversation, uh, congregation. Um, if you were today, it is more likely, um, certainly if you're coming out of seminary um, or ordained that you will actually, because of the often closure of black parishes or the merger you be more, you're you're as more likely to be serving in a white congregation like I am today in Gross Point, and um, what struck me is you know 19 years as a priest, 20 as a deacon, um, with with the exception of my time in South Africa and my time in Hawaii, I have been in predominantly white congregations. Um, Hawaii, it's, it was very multiracial, so I don't. There was maybe no one group, but whites were not the absolute majority there. Um, and so, to me, what struck me is, you know, how much of my quote black self um, comes. Which uh, so that's that that was what struck me. It was nothing new, but just for her to voice that out loud was. Um, it stays with me. Sometimes as a dialogue, my wife, when she hears my sermons, she says, did you say it that way? Because white people, if, you know, whereas um, I occasionally get to preach at a black congregation, particularly in February, Black History Month um, is also the month that we, black Episcopalians or the Episcopal Church as a diocese will celebrate Absalom Jones, the first black priest. So I've been uh, two or three dioceses had that opportunity. Um, and so, yeah, my style and everything changes, but that's partly because of my belief almost in bilingualism or code switching as linguists would say in how I address, you know, so that my audience can hear me. But, you know, so Gail's comment about that struck me particularly. Mm, appreciate that. Yeah. Well, Walter, I want to turn this over to you and the response team. I know you've done some work with them, uh, and and I'm gonna so I'm gonna spotlight our response team for us and let you uh, lead them in 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 the conversation. Okay, and um, I know Jean is there, but Dave also is there, and um, Lauren and Betsy. Um, by the way, can you all see? Because my I am, look like I am frozen. Can people? I hope people can still hear me. Right? Okay, I guess I'm frozen, so I don't know what happened there. Um, but uh, can I start with Betsy? Um, what your these responses are really, you know, as much about your reaction, what struck you, what gave you um, cause, pause, hope. Um, So I'm going to ask Betsy to begin us in this conversation. What what was it? What was your reaction, Betsy? Betsy, you're muted. I or I can't hear you. There we go, Betsy. Oh, this now morning, we... uh, two, two things really hit me when she said uh, that when you get to the door, you have to leave yourself when you walk in. That is, it's not the same when I walk in. When I walk into the doors of the church, I come to be filled and I don't think about what about me isn't in that church. For 
for blacks, I guess, because I am not black, um, to have that feeling of when you pass through the doors of a church, you have to leave part of yourself behind. It's something that I had never thought about. And um, it's very distressing for me um, to know that that's, that we don't have a lot of black um, parishioners, but when they come into our church, which I think is welcoming, that, that this element um, is part of their life. I, that is very distressing and I don't know what to do about it. The other thing is uh, being comfortable or uncomfortable. Um, it is not our job and Christ didn't tell us that our job is to be comfortable. In fact, he lived a very uncomfortable life and that's what he's asked us to do to live an uncomfortable life. And that means to me that there are times when we have to step out of quote unquote, what we consider our comfort zone and listen and work with what is not, what is not uh, easy for us. Mm. So, um, and the third thing I think that I asked both you, Walter, you and, and Drew, is as a white priest and as a black priest, how do you struggle with the uh, degree to which you want to talk to us and help us and form us around these issues, how far you can go? I think that's got to be a difficult question that you ask yourselves. Um, so those are my three kind of takeaways. Um, mostly, though, for Christ Church going forward, I, don't, I think we can't be afraid of being uncomfortable. Thank you for that. We'll come back to your question, but th thank you for that. I'm going to go away my screen of the screen. Um, Jean, and even if David wants to add anything, you know, what was your reaction to Gail's um, presentation and questions she raised? There were two big things that stood out for me. One was the whole idea that she started with and then spent a fair amount of time later on in her, in her comments to us about the idea of killing a part of yourself in order to come into a group. Yeah. Very much have had that experience as a female in the business world. And early in my career, those were explicit conversations. Am I willing to let go of aspects of myself in order to succeed in the way my male colleagues succeed? And I've typically chosen no, but it's really hard mm. and it's really um, uncomfortable and so that got me thinking to what's the distinction between assimilation and inclusion? We work hard. It seems like our both our, our um, um, women's rights and um, um, civil rights have um, been dominated by assimilation type practices. Mm -hmm. Really getting to the nitty gritty of how do we include others? How do we redefine um, success so that it's not being as white as possible or being as male as possible, right? How do we actually value differences enough so that we move more towards inclusion than assimilation in order to have diverse faces in the same, around the conference table in a business meeting or in the church pews on a Sunday morning? The second set of ideas that came to me was her, her phrase around brave space versus safe space. That, whoa. That's really cool. Yeah. When I, the more, and I think about it ever since, what's the distinction between brave space and safe space? And I keep going back to what's weird about it is that at the base of both is the same thing. Safe space is where I can trust, where I trust that I will be accepted. Well, if, if I'm in a safe enough space, I ought to be able to be brave enough to be myself. And so how yeah. can we actually transform our, our communities so that Safe space doesn't mean being nice. Safe space means being true. And, the, the, and then how does that then create um, the, the, uh, the potential for the kind of brave space that I think we need to, to have and build and um, commit to if we're ever gonna move forward on, on these things. Whether it's again, church, business settings, neighborhood, the whole, all of the places that we interact with others. How do we, you know, to, to Betsy's point, it's not about, it's safety, safe space isn't about being comfortable, 
safe space is about being able to be true. And that will, that will require bravery on all of our parts. Bravery to just listen sometimes. Bravery to tell the truth, find a way to tell the truth. Bravery to let go of our own ideas um, when we realize, when we actually bring our ideas, you know, I'm reading the um, Waking Up White book and the idea of, you know, oh yeah, that's right. Until we actually understand our own um, ideas around whiteness, it's going to be really hard to um, work the sort of inclusion versus assimilation agenda. Anyway, so those are the two ideas that came to me. Thank you for that. And I just want to just this before I turn to Lauren, um, that book, Waking Up White, it's one of the books that um, this, you know, group we started last um, weekend, um, Sacred Ground, which is the Episcopal Church's program. And I invite anybody that wants to um, join uh, us. Uh, the next time we'll be meeting on, it'll be Saturday via Zoom, Saturday, the December 5th, I think that is, that first Saturday in December. And you can reach out to me if you're interested, but um, it's a really good um, place to, to both, mostly films, but exploring these issues. And uh, I appreciate you mentioning the book, Jean. Lauren, um, yeah. what, what was your reaction to what Gail said? What struck you in that? Well, I, I guess, I, I was in full agreement with everything that she said. Um, I could see myself in some of those um, pronouncements. And um, in terms of my ethnicity and um, how Italianness is perceived as a form of blackness, which I'm Sicilian, which is the southernmost part of the boot or under the boot. Um, but what I have to say with a positive vein is, you know, as a younger person, I never would have probably stepped foot or felt comfortable coming into a, an Episcopal setting, but it was in my search for a place that felt inclusive that I settled upon the Episcopal setting. And the more I delved into what it means to be Episcopal, you know, you know, it came from England, yes, but the worldwide reach of the church, in my opinion, is it has become more inclusive. It has sought to listen to other voices and to have other voices be authorities, women, uh, ethnic, all ethnicities. Um, I was, when I first came to Christ Church for a funeral, Father Walter was the one that gave the homily. And I was, I was happy because it was, he spoke to me. Um, it, hearing his words, hearing his experiences um, throughout all of this. And the fact that Christ Church is now embracing this new call to talk about racism. To, um, to get us to, to get beyond the who we are and what we look like, to, to want to include everybody at the table, to feed everybody. There's nobody that we don't want to feed. We want to bring everybody and we want to feed them. That's Jesus's call to all of us, to want for us to nourish each other, to accept each other, to look at each other as a face, the face of God, looking in, into each of our faces, we see Christ, no matter who we are. That's what I got from coming into Christ Church because I saw the welcome to the altar, come get, you know, come be fed at the altar. Doesn't matter if you're Episcopalian, come to the altar, let Jesus feed you. So in that regard, I'm happy to call myself part of the Anglican communion at this point. Thank, thank you, Lauren. Um, I don't know, Father Drew, if, did, did you wanna make any observations? I, one thing, Betsy asked the question for the two of us and I thought may, maybe you'd want to chime in on that or anything else that um, struck you in the conversation. 
that we had with Gail? Let me add myself to the conversation then. Um, yeah, I, I, obviously I, I asked that question about um, what does it mean to kill a part of yourself? Um, that piece that uh, Betsy and, and, and Jean both uh, picked up on there. Uh, because I was, I, it was a really profound way. I mean, she, she, she said it differently at the very beginning. She said, we have to leave a portion of ourselves at the door. And then it, she, she, as she expanded on that, she used a, uh, the, the, I think, more provocative um, uh, expression. Um, and, it, you know, uh, and then uh, Betsy, I think your question is, as, as we go back was what's it like for, for Father and Walter and I to, to lead a congregation in, in, this, in this time. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll offer a couple of things in, 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 in response to those two pieces. One is um, my experience in the church um, has been extremely rich and also always challenging. Um, extremely rich growing up in Hawaii um, as, as a native Hawaiian within the Episcopal Church. Um, I think we have a very different, um, uh, Hawaii is a very unique culture, not a perfect community by any means, but a, a really a, a different, a more integrated culture than I've experienced anywhere else. Um, a place where um, differences are um, incorporated into our life, I think more naturally. Again, not perfectly. There, we can speak very, um, we can have a long conversation about what's left at the door um, uh, within, even within the community of Hawaii. Um, but for me, uh, growing up in the Episcopal Church in Hawaii with a priest who was Hawaiian, a father, excuse me, who was a priest, uh, and uh, and uh, um, uh, an uncle who was a priest, another uh, uncle who was a priest. I mean, the, the integration of, of my experience, uh, Anglican Hawaiian, uh, was much more natural uh, in Hawaii than it has been for me outside of Hawaii. Um, you know, when I leave when I leave Hawaii. Um, in fact, when I first left Hawaii in in, in for college. Um, I, for the first time, became a white person. Um, in Hawaii, I was, I, I, I'm Native Hawaiian, uh, and that identity is um, evident for a variety of reasons that aren't evident um, on the mainland, um, not the least of which is, our, you know, our, my heritage in Hawaii is, is a well-known heritage. Um, but it was it was it was eye opening to me when I went uh, even to college. I uh, went to Davidson College in North Carolina, uh, a predominantly white college um, with a with a, a, a large black community as well. And to suddenly realize that my identity was projected onto me um, by others, it was not simply what I experienced um, and. That, that identity was white. Um, I couldn't participate in the Black Student Union because I wasn't Black. I, uh, I couldn't participate in um, the minority community because the minority community was, uh, was perceived to be Black versus white. Uh, and I couldn't fully participate in the white community because that wasn't my, my identity. So, so it, it, and that, why do I start there? Because that's been my experience in, in the Episcopal Church and, and um, so to your question, Betsy, what, what does it mean? Um, I had a conversation with a woman priest, Jean, to your, your point early about um, what it's like for women to not just black individuals, um, the black community, but women as well to, to leave parts of themselves um, at the door. I, so I had a really profound conversation my first year in, in ministry with a, with a mentor of mine um, uh, talking about uh, some of these conflicts uh, 20 years ago. And she said to me, Drew, uh, you are 
uh, a male heterosexual priest with a heritage in the Episcopal Church that everyone will perceive as white. Um, and you have to use that place of privilege uh, and that place of access um, for the building up of a new community. Uh, so what is it like, Betsy? Uh, it's part of um, you know, the, the, the privilege that I have to serve at Christ Church, uh, the invitation that I have to, to come into this, this community, and, and, um, but also to use um, my office to expand our co conversation in our community. Um, and not just to perpetuate uh, privilege for, for those of us that either are or can easily enter into the, to white society, uh, but rather to help us expand our understanding and um, to create, I think, Gene, as you said it, not just um, a, uh, what was the distinction you made? Not just assimilation, uh, but a truly inclusive society. Um, some of you may have heard me say, you know, part of, part of being Hawaiian and coming to the mainland is real, realizing that I am always um, a cultural outsider. Uh, I remember the, the best example I have is when I went to Palm Beach, Florida, uh, and I asked Hap Warren, I was like, do I need a, who was the rector at Bethesda by the Sea at the time? do I need a blazer? And he just kind of looked at me and <laughs> chuckled and said, yes, you, you will want a blazer. <laughs> um, you know, I, I had worn at that point, I was, what was I, 30 some years old. I had worn a blazer and a tie for my graduation from high school, my graduation, I think from college. Um, and, you know, that was about it. Um, you know, I've, I, and I, I'm sure Walter has these stories, every woman around this around yeah. this has these stories about how we're trying to figure out how to fit in yeah. to the community that we're, that we're entering into, as opposed to, um, I think as Jean, Jean pointed out, how do, how do we just be ourselves? Yeah. Is who I am welcome in this place? You. Yeah, you know, Gene, your comment about the business world, and, you know, I was a lawyer for 10 years, and I think part of, in all of my time in, as a lawyer, I received checks from the, I was paid by the taxpayers, either the federal government or the city of Cleveland, and I also, as a summer student, um, again, the federal government or the state of California, and, and part of it was, is again, this idea, and I noticed, because when I got to law school in the mid 80s, women were probably by then 40%, um, get, but moving closer to 50% of the student population. But all of those things about being women, about being black, about being uh, Latinx, um, to get into law, there were these cultural things which required you to quote, assimilate. And I, and I did feel in the government, um, it, it was less of that, but not entirely, it wasn't entirely excluded. But the thing about the church, it's um, Father Drew's story about um, the Palm Beach and the, the blazer. Um, there's a legendary black priest who actually served in Inkster for a time, Inkster, Michigan, but went on, became kind of legendary for about 30 years. He was at a parish in New York City name was Fred Williams and died about 15 years ago. And when I was in seminary in New York City, um, he said to a group of us black seminarians, and I can't remember the quote exactly, I'll pull it up, but he basically said, and, and Fred Williams had been in the 60s and 70s, this very radical, all and civil rights activist and, and, and later H, um, HIV AIDS activism, his congregation was socially engaged. So he was by no means could be considered a sellout. But he said to us, these, these black seminarians, you're gonna have to learn to walk a certain way, to talk a certain way. And I knew this experience going through the ordination process and women also had this issue, but he said, walk and talk uh, a certain way. 
And then he said, um, and also how to make and appreciate a martini. <laughs> so very, and other than the martini, I, you know, I, yeah, I really appreciated the martini part, but um, <laughs> there is this, um, this is the issue around how church reflects culture. And one of Martin Luther King's famous quotes is that the church should not be a thermos, um, a thermometer. The church should not be a thermometer to tell you what the temperature is to reflect the culture, if you will. The church should be a thermostat, which actually sets the temperature. That's the issue about how we shape. It's not, you know, and that is our challenge. I think it really is our our challenge to do that in a way, and um, you know it's encouraging. For example, how many women bishops are being elected? But my my, my fear, or at least concern, is always um, that these women who are leading our diocese um, are they able to bring their whole self mm. in their leadership? Or do they feel, um, uh, you know, I'm the 11th bishop of whatever diocese. Do I have to act like, the, and I'm the first woman. Do I have to, you know, everything modeled on um, what was male leadership? Because they've talked about that, I believe. And Gene, you may want to add this. In, or Betsy, both of you having worked in corporations, that there are different ways that people lead, um, which may be shaped around gender or or you know, definitely where Father Drew grew up, there's a different, as he said, there's a different culture even in business there, but, you know, in, in lead. And if, and if you go to the, quote, mainland from Hawaii, you have to adapt to that. But I just wonder how much we would be richer if we could just bring our whole selves into all aspects. But at least in the church, we could at least begin there. You know, I, I've been immensely grateful, Walter, um, Jean, Betsy, Lauren, uh, and everyone for, for this time and this conversation today. Uh, I'm sure we could all easily, I certainly could easily continue on, um, but I'm, I'm going to be mindful of our, of our time together and also mindful that this is just the beginning of a long conversation that we are invited into um, throughout this year. Uh, we are fortunate um, to have uh, um, the, the scope of conversation that awaits us um, to, to, to engage together. Um, next week, we, in, we, are, we continue this conversation looking at the problems uh, we face and the hope we possess. Uh, we'll be fortunate to be joined by uh, Mr. Ray Suarez, who many of you will um, will perhaps remember from uh, his years of journalism with and uh, as a reporter and um, correspondent for um, uh, PBS NewsHour. He is author of several books. Uh, he's also a, a lifelong Episcopalian. Has had a, a um, a, a presence within the Episcopal Church, not only as a, as a boy, but also uh, continuing to this day within um, in, in circles that uh, Father Walter and I uh, know well within the consortium of endowed Episcopal uh, parishes in particular. Um, Ray will join us next week to explore um, the problems we're facing today as, a, as an American people, as a society, um, as well as the hope that we possess. Um, and what that means for us. Uh, so friends, I'm really excited um, and, and grateful for this time that we've had together and look forward to continuing our conversation, not just an ordinary conversation, but this sacred conversation that we are beginning together as a, as a community. Uh, so thanks for joining us today. Um, I'll stick around. I'm sure Father Walter will stick around for some of the, the conversation that uh, always ensues following a, a good forum and uh, discussion. And um, But I look, also look forward to seeing all of you next Sunday. Uh, same time, same Bat Channel for those of us that are old enough to remember Batman and his closing. Uh, same uh, next week. And um, we'll pick up the conversation then. Really wonderful to see all of you. And uh, Father Walter, thank you for helping to organize this uh, today's conversation with Gail. Uh, a thank you. 
Wonderful. Can I just say something before Alex leaves? I hope Alex is still there. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not leaving. I have plenty to say, Walter. Alex, so just to let you know, next week, Ray Suarez, I believe he is from the Bronx originally. So <laughs> Important connections to make. There well, you go. I know, yeah. I, again, I'll, I'll, I'm going to just recognize that some may want to, to, to um, have have breakfast maybe still today. So feel free to, to head along, uh, but uh, immense thanks for, for your joining us. Um, and uh, we'll stick around for a, a broader chit chat and conversation uh, that no doubt will follow. So blessings all and uh, look forward to seeing you guys again next week. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Yes. Alex, you said you had, you had lots to say. Yes, yes. Um, uh, wonderful conversation. Um, and uh, I just want to give you, I don't want to talk a, a lot about it. Uh, be, you know, you talked about being raised in Hawaii. Okay. I, I was raised in a very poor section of the Bronx. It was the South Bronx. I mean, it was classic South Bronx. It was tenements, there were Blacks, there were Hispanics, it was drug drug infested it was it was welfare ridden uh it was it, it was not the best of communities okay um but there were jewish people there were there it was it was a mix there were there were good people and there were very bad people in the neighborhood okay um the the highlight of the of of being raised and we and i was listening to about leaving your yourself um across the street from me literally across the street from me was where colin powell was raised he he knew my family um he he, he and and colin powell was in the military became secretary of state he, you know he, he was a wonderful person went to city college but this with what I'm trying to get to is that even within this community, there were people who through family or through whatever, drove to success. Um, and they brought with them their culture. So there's plenty I have to add, but um, not that. And the other thing I want to bring out is that being raised in New York City gave me an advantage because everyone, there was such a diversity. Um, and, and during the time I was raised, everybody wanted to know where you are Puerto Rican or Dominican, are you Irish, are you Italian? It was all part of the culture, part of all part of the conversation. And wherever you went, you brought your culture with you and everybody said, okay, you know, you're Lithuania. All right, all right. Yeah, we know the Lithuanians. Oh, you're Irish. Yeah, your father's a cop. You're Italian. Ah, right, you work sanitation. We all knew these things. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a part of the conversation I want to bring. You know, uh, not so much that we checked ourselves at the door, but we, we brought those strengths to succeed. And, and, and a number of us has to see. So, I'm sure Ray succeeded in his way. I am fortunate to, to, if I could say, I don't want to say succeeded, but I am fortunate to be in a place where I, get, I, I raised a loving family. That's the biggest, the biggest thing that I could tag on. That's, and I look forward to these conversations. So that may be too long, but that's my perspective. Yeah. No, no, no. Father Drew, can I just say something? Actually, yeah. the, Alex, um, and I, you mentioned Colin Powell, and he talks about in his biography, the Episcopal Church, he, his parents being Jamaican, he you know, that basic British thing of being an Anglican. So St. Margaret's, the, the thing I want, <clears throat> two things I wanted to say is one, St. Margaret's Episcopal Church in the Bronx, which is still going on, um, was the church that he grew up in, was an altar boy and all of that. Um, he says that being an altar boy helped him when he went into the military, um, you know, but 
the other piece at, at a conversation that I, I've had with Ray Suarez before, and he's mentioned, and you, what you told is actually the beauty of New York City, and particularly where you grew up, of these different ethnic groups, and you bring yourself. And, and one of the books that Ray wrote was, was really about um, what happened in America, <coughs> white flight developed and the suburbanization. And I think the name of the book was, might've been called There Goes the Neighborhood and how in too many parts of our American cities, the richness of urban life and that kind of diversity um, melted away after the second world war with development of suburbs that then became um, really the real estate industry and the banking and all that, um, that promoted a segregation um, of basically uh, as more and more Blacks, particularly in, in Northern cities, moved into areas coming from the South. Um, and we lost, as and Suarez made, we, we lost that diversity, that um, living cheek and jowl in the cities um, required you to do. So I, I just, so what you said, I love what you shared and it, it actually resonates with um, what I know our next week's speaker will say, but also just what it, life, what life was like in an earlier time. Okay, Walter, uh, just briefly, I could draw a line in the sand and tell you when the Bronx changed. The Bronx okay. changed when heroin infested neighborhood in the late sixties. Within yeah. a period of four to five years, mm -hmm. people, stable families, whichever race, whether they were Italian, Puerto Rican, Dominican, they 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 left. They left the South yeah. Bronx because they needed to protect their family. Yeah, that's another element of it. Yep, yeah, you're you're correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. I, okay. Um, uh, what uh, I appreciate what you've said, Alex, um, and it, uh, and I I don't have a New York experience to 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 speak to, um, <laughs> except my first experience at at uh, the General Seminary uh, years ago when I was looking <laughs> seminaries. Uh, I I mean I can I can remember it viscerally. Uh, still uh, back, it was, this would have been uh, in 1995, my first real New York experience. Um, and walking out of Chelsea Square uh, and looking up at the buildings and saying, this is amazing and hell no, I can't do this. Uh, <laughs> it was too big uh, for, for this kid. Um, yeah. That that's about that's about as uh, much of a New York experience as as, as I have. Um, I, I I just want to say something on a personal level, though, about um, leaving our heritage or uh, and bringing our heritage and how complex that is. I am here. Let, let's. Um, I'll, I'll just my experience. I am the ninth Native Hawaiian priest um, ordained in the Episcopal Church. Um, wow. wow. That's wow. it. Um, I am the fourth from my family. Um, so, so that, that, that's um, uh, telling. There, there, I, I think we might be up to 11 or 12. I think, um, you, I think it's 12. I think it's, well, yeah. Malcolm Tun died, but I think there are now, yeah, I think there was 12 that have been ordained. Yeah. Three, of, three of them were ordained when I was there, yeah. Um, but but I, I am here at Christ Church um, because of my white heritage. There, that, that cannot be um, overstated. Uh, in 1897, uh, when Hawaii was annexed uh, by, uh, by American forces and American business leaders, uh, one of the first actions that was taken uh, was to outlaw Hawaiian language. 
That meant if you spoke, if you spoke Hawaiian in public, uh, or if you spoke Hawaiian in schools in particular, you were um, either reprimanded, punit, or punished. Uh, it meant that Hawaiian newspapers were um, had to were forced underground if they could if they could survive it at, at all. Um, the the consequence was um, that there were there was a path towards success that was defined. And this is just one event. I mean, we can go, go, go back into things that preceded that. The success and access to power, education, um, wealth um, in Hawaii was, was defined by your ability to speak English. Okay, your ability to enter into white society in native in, in, in 19th and early 20th century Hawaii. Um, why is that profound in my family? I, I had a, 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 a great grandfather who was English, an English captain uh, who had married a, a Hawaiian woman um, and the same on my mother's side, is that right? So my great grandfather and great grandmother um, said to uh, my grandmother and her siblings uh, in English, after going back into their room, coming back out to the family, saying to the family in English, we will never speak Hawaiian again in this household. Wow. Uh, so my family at that, at that moment of, of uh, time, is able to make a transition that nine out of 10 native Hawaiian families are not able to make. And that is to immediately enter into the white stream, the American stream of success. Uh, it's what, <coughs> what continues, right? My family, you've heard of Punahou schools, the school that Barack Obama went to. My family had graduates from the first class. We're, we're, we're in the first class of, of students at Punahou. Uh, and just about every generation, so my grandparents, my parents, myself, all from Punahou school, that be, is maintained because of our, our, our ability to speak English, right? Um, that, I, I see you, Alex. Um, and uh, the, the communities that were unable to, to make that migration um, are um, generations behind. Uh, and so I, I just for me, the, this conversation I hope is one that opens our eyes to what's, what, what's happening in other lives um, uh, as well. Alex, you... you, you... And, and just very briefly, we're similar, Drew. We're very similar. The Spanish-American War is when Sp America won and they've got all these possessions. One of the possessions was Puerto Rico. And my grandmother was born 1905, okay? And when she went and became a teacher in Puerto Rico, they, they only were taught in English. That was it. There was no, that was, you know, you know I'm not sure if they ever made it illegal, but she became a teacher, uh, but it wasn't Puerto Rican, it was, it was English. And to be a teacher in Puerto Rico in 1920, 22, you had to teach in English, okay? From there, she, she, my grandfather, whatever, they came to the US and they had that advantage. They were Puerto Rican, but they had the advantage that they were fully assimilated in the English language. There was no accent. So we are similar in, in, that, in that line. Okay, we can continue this conversation other people want to talk, but I just wanted to bring that highlight. Yeah, I can appreciate that, Karen. I just watched last uh, last week the movie Thirteenth, which made me 
alarmingly aware of what my country's government has done to so many people. It, I've never been so disturbed in my life. Part of it's it, it's part of our our heritage as an American people, and 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 uh, part of this conversation. And I I saw your hand there, Sue. So uh, just a moment. Part of this conversation is to help us grapple uh, with that that history and the future that that awaits us, um, and to think that we we can the future is open um, to us. But a positive or reformed future depends on our ability to grapple also with our past. Sue Chaklos. Um, I just want to say that movie 13 undid me too, horribly. And I also want to say um, the ability to speak English without an accent is tied into the whole redlining in Gross Point as to what ethnicities could move or not move in. So if you were Italian, but you did not speak with any, any Italian accent, um, and when I'm talking 60s and 70s, you would have an easier time trying to buy a house um, in Gross Point than someone who um, definitely did not speak American English without an accent, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, these, these you know, that's... Calls? Yeah, these policies are just. They're, they're, they, they, they go back, just a second, Lauren, uh, they go back generations. I mentioned, um, you know, the, the outlawing of Hawaiian was but one uh, in 1848. Um, one of the most devastating uh, 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 policies was the, the Great Mahele, the, the distribution of land in Hawaii and uh, a requirement to, to to own land um, in Hawaii became your ability to read and write English. Um, and, you know, 20 years into uh, a, a English colonization, fundamentally 20 years into English colonization, the, the, the proportion of Hawaiians that could, could read and write English, as you can appreciate, was relatively small. Um, and, um, and, and the dispossession of, um, of, of property and, and therefore wealth in Hawaii um, was set in stone uh, 170 years ago. And that's, uh, that Hawaii is just one example of what, is ha what has happened uh, over the years um, to sue to, to your point, to be able to read, to speak without accent. Um, you know, um, I, I am keenly aware that um, I, I have an ability to step into places because of that education uh, that, you know, go back to Hawaii. Um, you know, my family uh, lived in particular parts of Hawaii that the vast majority of Native, Hawaii, Native Hawaiians um, couldn't live in. Um, you know, all, uh, well, I shouldn't say all on account. I mean, Hawaii, uh, one has to be honest about, uh, you know, Hawaii was um, not only, um, uh, was still a caste society prior to, um, prior to, to the arrival of Captain Cook. And, um, and so, the reason uh, Thomas, Captain Thomas Mossman married uh, my great grandmother was because of her status within Hawaiian society. So, you know, the other side to, to my heritage is not just my white heritage, it's also the heritage of wealth um, and, and, and status and power, uh, you know, married in the 19th century with, um, with, with race. Um, and it's, it's the, the weaving together of, of wealth and, uh, and race that uh, we have to unpack uh, today. Lauren, I saw you um, a few minutes well, ago, I'm sorry. I guess the, the thing I was gonna say was in my 
in my dad's family, his, his father came directly from Italy and his mother's grandma or mother came from Italy. Um, but in my dad's home, it was emphasized that you spoke English and, um, and, and my dad really didn't want to have anything to do with being Italian. He wanted to fit in with white, um, you know, so it, you know, it's, it was always, I guess, emphasized in all of the ethnicities in our country to assimilate into one, you know, cohesive, you know, wipe away whatever background you have. This is what you're supposed to do now. You're supposed to be, a, you know, just a homogeneous instead of heterogeneous group. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. But these, these are, I think, are the challenges that we are uh, facing as, as a society, how to do this differently. Um, you know, we've used for, um, uh, Dr. King brought this, um, this phrase kind of coherently um, to, our, to our lives and it's, it's emerging today. Um, but how to, to, to become that beloved community in which uh, the the unique unique gifts that we bring are appreciated and incorporated rather than hidden uh, hidden away uh, or checked at the door. Uh, how do we and and the conversation I hope that we continue to have is what work do I need to do to create that space for another um, uh, so that that becomes part of our life. Um, as opposed to um, uh, perpetuating uh, the, shall I say, dysfunctions uh, that we, we still experience today. Um, Betsy, you said it so brilliantly at the, the beginning uh, of your reflection that, you know, uh, um, the, the heartbreak to think that individuals uh, um, are leaving part of themselves um, to be part of my life, right? How, uh, how, and Jean touched on that, that when she entered into the work, to, to, to the business world, that she had to leave some of her femininity um, at, uh, at, at the door. Um, well, what kind of society, what kind of um, community um, does that to one another? What, I mean, certainly not, it's not what we do at, at, in the home, right? Um, well, why, are, why are we doing this uh, in our churches? Why are we doing this uh, in our workplaces? How do we do it differently? Um, uh, that's the question I hope we, we continue to explore uh, throughout the coming, coming weeks and coming months together. So, um, well, friends, I, I really I cherish this conversation and I look forward to picking it up uh, again. I am gonna uh, sign off at this point so I can uh, go and uh, have, have my, uh, a cup of coffee with Jessica this morning. So it's really been delightful to be with all of you. Um, life continues this week. Um, morning prayer, evening prayer, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday it will not happen Thursday and Friday. Although I might just sneak on. <laughs> you can peek and you might find somebody there. Uh, just a real great, uh, it's, a, it's a gift. Uh, and uh, so I'll look forward to, to seeing you folks. But everything happens. Yes, Betsy? Don't sign on you right, right. i love it you and the staff have the week off you deserve it you need it it's for your health we're fine i know you're fine, fine. I, I i don't find i don't i i this, this is not <laughs> Maybe, this is not anyway it it's just i i i love seeing you guys so i we, we pray <laughs> you know i i've been thinking about it for days actually betsy like i was like well I, so if if I'm I, the, here's what I'm saying, I feel no obligation. <laughs> if I'm, if if you sign on and I'm there, amen. <laughs> if you sign on and I'm not there, 
Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for this gift yeah. of sacred conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I'm sorry, for some reason, my camera has been really acting up today. It's like frozen or. You're not kid. frozen to us. You're not frozen. No, you've, you've never been oh, really? frozen to us. You never oh, have. And then at one point, it, it had me stop video, but. It wasn't, I mean, it was, I, you know. Was, I, I think, Walter, you signed in twice, and I yeah. suspect you were looking at, you were seeing your, your other login yeah. uh, right. and not the one we were seeing. So you were, right. you were great the whole I time was, from our perspective. It, it, that, it threw me off, but um, yeah. anyway, this was fun. Thank you so much. Um, well, it was more than fun. It was a super important conversation that we don't have the, we have not had the patience to talk about, but this is it. This is, we're at a crossroads and we all know it. So thank you for getting us over the threshold. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to say, you know, this has been hard for clergy. We don't have communion with you all. And um, it's just hard on everyone. But, you know, there's a friend of mine said, you know, what what can be a quote blessing out of this? And so we, we got like Ray Suarez, T today we had Gail, we had Ray Suarez, we've got some other great people, um, none of whom are in Michigan, frankly, um, although when we do the topic, because we're following in some ways, at least the first several, the sacred ground discussions, so we, we've got a young woman <laughs> author, who's a Potawatomi um, cool. native, uh, she lives in um, I think Nashville or somewhere else now, but her family originally. So the fact that we can get these people to join us via Zoom is a blessing. Mm -hmm. We would not have been able to, you know, in one year fly all of these people in conversation. So um, well, I think it was, was it's super valuable. I appreciate your all hard work. Thank you. Thank so you. Well, spread the word. Uh, we can we can add more to the conversation. So um, we we'll look forward to seeing you all again next week. Uh, again, same 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 time, same channel. Thanks. God bless, God bless you all. Enjoy Bye. your vacation. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. See you. <laughs> all right.